Good morning! We are in a series looking at courageous women of faith in the Bible, and today we're looking at an amazing woman named Deborah. Her story is found in the Old Testament, kind of near the beginning, in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 4. And this is such a powerful example in scripture of a God using a woman to lead his people, to free his people from their enemies and to restore peace. It is such a beautiful story. And you might be thinking, well, you know, why did God choose to use a woman in such a male dominated era? Was this a fluke? Were there no righteous men available? So he had to use a woman. And I think that as we study scripture, what we find is that God gives women many places of important influence for his kingdom purposes. You know, God gives women many places of important influence for his kingdom purposes. We find that God used women in the Old Testament as prophets to proclaim his truth. Huldah was an example we see in 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. And we see that, that godly men went to Huldah and they sought wisdom from her, which was wisdom from God. We also see Miriam in the Old Testament in Exodus. Um, and Miriam was a leader at the time of Moses. We see, we see that being clarified in the book of Micah chapter 6, verse 4. And then God used women in the New Testament to proclaim his truth. We see in the book of Acts, we see in the book of Luke, there was Anna. And we find that in Luke chapter 2, verse 36, Anna was a voice of God to proclaim truth. And we also see Philip's daughters in Acts chapter 21, verse 9. Now, some people say that Deborah was God's plan B because he couldn't find any godly men to lead in these days of disobedience in Israel's culture. But I don't believe that God ever has a plan B. He's God. He's sovereign. He doesn't need a plan B because he is able to bring about his best and highest purposes in plan A. And even if that tends to rock all human constructs, he is just able to do that. So let's just kind of think about some background here. Open your Bibles to Judges chapter 4. Let's begin by looking at verses 1 through 3. It says, And the people of Israel did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera. So remember that name, Sisera. Sisera lived in Herosheth Hegoim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. For he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Okay, so we're reminded right away that the people at this time were doing evil. They, this, was, this was a time when Israel had become very disobedient to the Lord. Their culture had disintegrated into godlessness and idol worship. And they were weakened because of their idolatry. And that weakness, that worshiping of false gods, caused them to be subservient to the Canaanites, who then invoked fear and terror in their lives. Look at verse 4. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Labadoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. So in this culture, positionally right now, women were subordinate to men in these days. So Deborah's elevation to rulership over Israel is literally groundbreaking. That was not the norm. God was in a season of raising up judges to lead the nation during this time. Remember, this is the time before there were kings. This was when Israel was a theocracy. God was their king, and, they, and he then raised up judges uh, to enact justice and order and to maintain law. And he also had prophets who were used as his mouthpiece to speak truth and wisdom and to call the people to repentance, to warn them about coming judgment if they didn't turn back to, to being um, obedient to God and to worshiping the one true God of Israel. 
So the judges were like the leaders of the nation, and the prophets were like the voice of God into the nation. And here we have Deborah, who is a female judge and a prophetess. The only other person in scripture that was the combination of these two, of judge and prophet, was Samuel. Samuel. So look at verse 6. Deborah sent and summoned Barak, the son of Ahinoam, and from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go gather your men at Mount Tabar, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. So she's a prophetess, right? Deborah's a prophetess. So basically she sends a message to Barak, who's, who's the commander of the, of the army. Kind of, she actually kind of sends him a lightning bolt, and she tells him what to do with the military. She tells him, look, God is going to give you victory over your enemy, Sisera. He, he's going to give you victory. It's a, it's, a, it's a prophecy of truth that she is proclaiming to the army of her general, uh, the general of her army, about their arch enemy, Sisera, 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 however you want to say it. So, verse 8, Barak, army general, says to Deborah, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. So, he's like, his response, literally, to God, giving him this revelation through Deborah, is conditional obedience. He's saying, well, I'll obey if you go with me, Deborah. So, Deborah goes. She goes along. She gives Barak, her army general, strength to accomplish God's purposes. It is a good example, actually, of a man and a woman partnering together for God's purposes. It makes me think about who in my life do I need to partner with to help um, them accomplish God's purposes. What about in your life? <clears throat> well, verse 9, and she said, Deborah said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, Brock, for the Lord will sell Sisera, Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out to Zebulun and Naphtali, these are, these are tribes in Israel, to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with them. So basically what happens is that Barak has responded with conditional obedience, and because of that, Deborah prophesies again, and she says, because you are not willing to obey God unconditionally, you are not going to get the glory for defeating Israel's enemy. Instead, she's saying, the glory is going to go to a woman. Now, it's not Deborah. Though she's the one prophesying, it's actually the glory is not going to even go to her. God is going to use another woman to defeat Sisera. Sisera. Um, God is actually going to use a woman named Jael to drive a tent peg into his heart. And so um, we, it's, it's a good reminder that God's purposes will be accomplished no matter what, because God is sovereign, but also that we lose a blessing when we don't obey God unconditionally, when we set conditions for our obedience. Now grab your Bibles. I know that uh, I don't typically read a lot of text to you, especially when there's so many names I can't pronounce. Um, but this is a story that we don't read very often. We don't often open our Bibles to Judges, and this is not a story that we spend a lot of time in typically. And so I really want you to read with me as we go through the rest of the story and see what happens. So let's start at verse 11. Now Heber the Canaanite had separated from the Canaanites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pinch, pinched his tent as far away as the oak of Zenanianim, which is near Kadesh. When Sisera, remember, bad guy, was told that Barak, army general, the son of Ahinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Herosheth Hegoim to the river Kishon, and Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? 
So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and he fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Heroseth Hegoyim, and all the army of Sisera's fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Okay, do you get what happened here? Uh, there was a battle. Sisera somehow gets away. Barak fights all of Sisera's men. Everyone dies by the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera, see the one guy they wanted to kill, he fled away on foot, and he went to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenanite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenanite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, so, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel, and the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. That's a big battle story, isn't it? Big story. But what can we learn about Deborah? What can we learn? Well, Deborah had a lot of different hats that she wore, and let me tell you about some of them. First of all, she was a prophetess. That means that she had the ability to discern the mind and the will of God and to declare it to others, to speak it out. You know, in these days, God spoke his word to his people through the mouths of prophets and prophetesses. A lot of what we have recorded in the Bible, in the Old Testament, are words from the prophets, are words from the, from the prophetesses. And um, so they, they acted like intermediaries between God and man. And they were highly esteemed, and their, the truth of their words was legitimized by the reality in which it played out in real time, in history. So a true prophet was known as a true prophet when he was able to speak something and it came to pass just exactly as he spoke it. The, the reality of what happened validated whether the person was a true prophet or not. So she was a true prophetess. We see this in this story. Everything she said came true exactly as she said it. Secondly, she was a judge and a judge was a leader. She was a leader in the nation of Israel. She was the fifth of the judges of Israel, whom God raised up to deliver his people from bondage. She would sit uh, at the, at a particular, under a particular tree and she would give counsel. She would give legal counsel. She sat under a date palm tree that was actually named after her. And the people would go to her with their disputes and she would solve their disputes. She would settle their issues. She was also a wife. Um, she was, oh, people often assume that um, her husband must have been weak or he, he must have been, you know, uh, um, she, that he must have been ineffective um, because, she, because he was married to such a, a powerful, influential leader. And why was he not the leader? Why was she the leader? But it's not so. She, he probably admired her abilities and admired the influence of his wife. His name literally means torches, so likely he was behind the scenes as an encourager to his wife. God had a calling on her life, but she was a woman married to, to her husband. She was also a maternal figure. So in Judges chapter 5, verse 7, she's called the mother of Israel. Now we actually don't know if she had any children. Scripture doesn't record that. But um, even if she didn't have any biological children, her, the role that she played and the title that she had came from her leadership of the nation. She was like a mother to the people. 
She was also an agitator. So she was a person who stirred the people up and she stirred them up about their very low spiritual condition. You know, they were being oppressed by the Canaanites. They were living in fear. They were dealing with spiritual apathy. And she woke them up and she called them to be free of their apathy and their bondage. She called them to fight for freedom against their enemies. She was also an artist. Uh, Deborah was a singer and a songwriter. She was a very multifaceted person. She had a, a strong right brain creatively and she had a strong left brain. She had a lot of gifts. In Judges chapter 5, it, we, the next chapter, we see a song that she wrote about the event, about all that happened. And it's one of the first examples of ancient Hebrew poetry. In this song, which you can read next when we're done, uh, she praises God as being the one who led the Israelites to conquer their enemies. So as we look at Deborah, you know, she was a woman of great faith, of tremendous strength, and of deep trust in God. After this battle was won, it's, this is the most incredible part. After the success of this battle, which we read about in Judges 4, and, and the song is about in Judges 5, Deborah ruled Israel with wisdom and fairness for 40 years. Isn't that incredible? She ruled for 40 years. And during the 40 years that followed what we just read, Israel had rest from war, they had rest from captivity, and they le lived in total peace. Wow, what a blessing. She is one of my heroes. Well, let me ask you, first of all, as we look at our culture, what evil in the sight of the Lord do we see in our culture? What godlessness, what um, departure from biblical values and perspectives do you see? What do you think are the enemies that rally against our faith as Christians? Um, what are the things that challenge our faith in God? What are the things that we, would, that we would see in our culture that would be enemies that try to lure us into idolatry and, and, and further godlessness? In what areas are we tempted to only obey God on condition, to obey Him uh, conditionally rather than unconditionally? What blessing might be awaiting us if we actually had the courage to step out in faith and trust God to meet us in the scary places? Who do you need to come alongside in order to encourage in their faith? Um, yes, Barak responded to God's um, prophet, to the prophecy that Deborah gave him conditionally. He missed out on a huge blessing. But at the same time, he also, Deborah was willing to partner with him, to walk alongside him, to help give him courage. Who is, is waiting for you to do that with them? And what does that look like for you? What attributes of Deborah inspire you? We've just talked about a whole bunch of them. Um, so these are good things to think about today. And so let me pray for us as we go into our days. Father, thank you so much for Deborah. Thank you so much for her life and for her courage, her ability, her willingness to obey you and to um, speak out the words that you gave her to speak and to come alongside Barack in this battle, to um, lead and be instrumental in bringing a season of peace to Israel and a season of obedience to you. Thank you, Lord, for her example. Thank you for the example of using such an unlikely person in such a time as this. Uh, we're so grateful for the stories in your word where you used powerful women to serve you in instrumental ways. And of course, they were only powerful because they trusted in you so fully. So thank you. We're inspired by her example today. Help us to be willing to step into the scary places in our lives. Help us to trust you in the places where we feel afraid. Help us to obey you absolutely unconditionally so that we can enjoy the greatest blessing that you have prepared for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, if you're following along on the River Study, uh, next week is spring break. And that means that tomorrow we will not have a, a psalm teaching on the River YouTube page. Um, so I hope you have a great weekend. If you're going away on spring break some, somewhere, I hope you have a wonderful time. Uh, I will actually be back with you on Monday here on the Mornings with Marianne channel. And on Monday, I'm going to introduce you to the book of Esther. And we're going to spend all next week looking at the book of Esther. 
Then we're going to spend the following week looking at Mary Magdalene. I'm super excited to look at Mary Magdalene with you. And I'm going to give you a little preview. Then I'm going to bring this, um, this series to a close, this series of, of Courageous Women of Faith. And I'm actually going to, to um, bring this whole um, d video devotional to a close uh, right before we go into Easter. Um, so I'm really excited about finishing up this, these conversations about these women. And um, I hope you have a great, great weekend. And I look forward to seeing you on Monday.